Thank you for your singing. Please turn around and wave to those around you. Welcome to God's house. Welcome. I'm going to invite Pastor Ron Russell to come up. He's going to share the um, morning prayer time with us. Um, good people, it's uh, good to be here with all of you this morning. And I praise the Lord for Bob and Nancy and their ministry here. Let's be in the attitude of prayer. Most gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for each and every day. We thank you, Lord, that at a very special moment, at a very special time, we, each of us, turned our lives over to your son, Jesus Christ, and have followed him. We want to be on his path, Heavenly Father, and we ask that you enable us to go out and be your disciples by that great commission you've given to us and help others to know the joy that we have in knowing Jesus. Having the fellowship that we have when we get together with other believers having the fun, having the laughter, having the joy of just simply knowing Jesus. Lord, we thank you for Paul Perryman who's here today and thank you for increasing his health and asking that you continue to be with him. With Merv Troyer, we continue to ask for healing and watching over him. With Dan Keim, we Ask Heavenly Father that because of the good health that he is in and, and headed in the right direction that within two weeks he'll be able to go home, which is where he wants to be. We thank you for that healing, Heavenly Father, and we ask that you continue to put that hedge of protection around him. For Shirley Hoover, Heavenly Father, we thank you for her recovery and ask that you watch over her as well. Lord, in the name of Jesus, we ask that you watch over all of us. Show us the way that you would have us to go and help us, Lord, to just simply be your vessels so that even before we say anything, just by the smiles on our face, by our demeanor, people will want to know what it is that we have and then we have the chance to tell them all about Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, for this church, for the mission of this church, for what we are and what we will be doing throughout our community, throughout this county, throughout this state, and beyond, and ask, Lord, that again, just be with us. Use us and help us, Lord, with each and every day as we get up, we turn our lives over to you, turn our lives over to our Savior, and then do your work. Lord, we give this all up and we do it now in Jesus' powerful name as we pray the prayer that your Son taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. If the ushers would come forward at this time. Honor the Lord by giving God the first part of our income through our tithes and the Lord's offering. Thank you.
Stand for the doxology, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these gifts from your people, the offerings from the work of their hands. Bless it, Lord, to build your kingdom. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. The scripture this morning is 2 Peter 3, verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the both glory now and forevermore. Amen. You are like an ocean, I've been playing on the shore. Now I'm diving in because I want to know you more. You are like a mountain. I've been camping at the base. Now I'm heading to the top. I want to see your face. I want more. Give me more. More of you. Lord, I open my mind and my heart to receive all you give. I want more. Give me more. More of you. And may this holy I will never comprehend why you would desire to know me as a friend. You've been waiting for me. I've been wasting time. Now I'm running to you. My arms are open wide. I want more. Give me more. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. How many of you have ever felt like, Lord, I, I just want more of you in my life? 
and you, you develop this relationship with God, and it's been so good that you say, Lord, give me more. How many of you heard that phrase, God is good all the time, and you respond with, and all the time, God is good. Let's try that again. God is good all the time, and all the time, God is good. And so, knowing that God is so good, and that we love the Lord, and the Lord's, uh, Lord loves us, then we would want to know more and say, God, give me more. Give me more. So I've been in this preaching business now for coming up to close to 30 years in youth ministry and, and adult um, senior pastor ministry. And one of the things I've learned is there's, there's basically three kinds of sermons that a pastor can, can preach. And the first one is inspirational. And, and you, you preach that, and everyone goes, oh, that was nice, that was sweet, oh, thank you, Pastor. And then there's other sermons that are teaching sermons where we open the Bible and we kind of go expositorily, and we say, look at this verse, and we go, wow, the depth of that really fills my heart and deepens me. And then there's a sermon that I call Amen or Ouch, okay? Now, the Amen or Ouch are convicting sermons where I bring up situations in our lives to say, this is the standard, Jesus Christ. Now, Jesus Christ was perfect, wasn't he? And so, if this is who God tells us to be like, and that's perfection, where are we at on the perfection scale? See, I'm about right here, and Jesus is here. Today's sermon is going to be an amen or ouch. Because I'm going to point out the scriptures that say this is the standard. This is the way God wants us to live our lives. The title of my sermon is How to Grow Spiritually. And if we want to be a disciple, the root word of disciple is discipline. How many like discipline? <laughs> We're not big fans of discipline because it requires work. But discipline is what makes us like Jesus Christ, the perfection that God wants us to be. Amen? Amen. So today is going to be an amen or ouch. And so if you feel a part, go amen. Shout it out. But if you feel a part, go ouch, go ouch. It's all right with me. So the three points that I want to talk about today and how to grow spiritually would be the first is the spiritual baby stage. Secondly, the spiritual youth stage. And then third, the spiritual adult age. Now, Some of you in this room have been going to church or you've been Christians now for 50 plus years. And so I have a question for you. And for those of you that are home watching on Monday or Tuesday when this is put on there, when it comes to your faith, are you a participant or are you a mature Christian? Because there's a big difference between the two. You see, sometimes people say, well, I'm a Christian because I go to church. Well, let me remind you that going to church no more makes you a Christian than going to McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. Amen? It just doesn't work that way. Okay? We have to have that discipline. We have to have that prayer life. We have to have that Bible study. We have to have that engaging of the Spirit, Holy Communion. So, those of you that have raised children, there are different stages to to raising children. I'm going to compare this to the stages of being a Christian. Do you remember moms and dads when you brought that little one home from the hospital? And they were just, they were just babies. And they needed us as parents 24-7. We just had to care for them. And we call this the infant stage. And when someone becomes a Christian, they're just like a little baby. You see, they move from that until they hit their twos and threes. And we call them toddlers. And they are so busy. They're just here and there. And they're, they're going and they're so fast. And, and so they're trying to develop. They're learning how to talk. And, and so they're learning things from mom and dad. And maybe, you know, a little bit later they go to preschool. But, you know, we still have to care for them. And these are called the caring years. The caring years. The next stage of being a parent is the early childhood stage. And this is from ages 3 through 13. Okay, and I call this the training stage. Okay, now moms and dads, if you remember, this is where they learn their ABCs of life. This is where they learn about manners. This is where they learn about church and the fundamentals of life. And I believe that in the raising of children, this is the most important the training years. 
And the better job that parents do in the training years, the easier the teenage years will become. Those of you who have raised children, particularly teenagers, those are some rough years. Help us, God. Amen? And so these training years are really important. One of the things that I want to bring to our attention is something uh, that has been lost in our American culture. How many of you, when you were raising your children, ate around the table pretty much most of the time during the week? Okay. That is not the case anymore. The number one utensil, kitchen utensil, in young families now is the drive through window at a restaurant. Stop and think about this. When you were raising your children and mom and dad were at the table and they were eating, what did the children learn? They learned manners. They learned what was important in mom and dad's life. They learned their work ethic. There's so much that we learned and we're I just want to encourage families to get back to the table. As I've studied this and researched this, in America, there are two groups of people in America that still sit at the table and find it important. The first group are Jews. The Jewish have ceremony when they eat. The second group is our neighbors, the Amish. Two groups in our American culture that still do that. And I want to encourage young families to continue to do that. And then there's the teen adolescent years. That's ages 13 through 19. We call them the wonder years. They're learning their morals. They're learning what's right and wrong. And they're stretching out a little bit who they are. They dream about what life is going to be as an adult. We call these the coaching years. These are the years that mom and dad coach. If you've raised teenagers, you know that that teenager is like a bar of wet soap. <laughs> and so if you have a bar of wet soap, that teenager, you can do two different things. You can either hold it too tight, and what happens to wet soap when you hold it too tight? Boo, it slips out. Or you can hold it too loosely, and it can slip out. Those coaching years are where we come in and out and not hold our teenagers too tight, but not let them do whatever they want to do. It's the coaching years. The better we do at the training years, the easier that they'll be at the, teen, uh, the training years, the coaching years. The last stage is early adulthood stage, the 20s or 30s. You remember when your uh, child went off to college and then they graduated college. I call this the friendship years where the training is done, the coaching is done. And they may call you and say, Mom or Dad, how, how do I handle this situation? And as a friend, you help them through that experience. And so those are the different stages as we raise their, our children. And I want to parallel that this morning to what it means to be a Christian looking at the Bible. Now, I want to take you to 1 Corinthians chapter um, 3, verse 1. And here's what Paul said. Brothers and sisters, I could not address you as people who live by the Spirit, but as people who are still worldly, mere infants in Christ. So these are people who went to church, but they argued with each other. They fussed with each other. They weren't growing up. They were still in kindergarten spiritually. In fact, they, they, they started this thing called a fellowship meal. So before church, they would have this fellowship meal, and then people would bring food and then people would just run for the line and just gorge themselves and, and eat all the food. And then people at the end of the line wouldn't get anything or just get the crumbs. And Paul was saying, grow up. They were in moral decay. You see, they believed that they added Christ to their life, but they didn't subtract sin. They were in trouble. When you become a Christian... You ask God to forgive you of your sins, right? And God takes that away. And the Holy Spirit comes into your life. We call that salvation. And then from that point on, it is our responsibility to become more like Jesus Christ. We call that sanctification. That every single day, you become more like Jesus Christ through Scripture reading, through a prayer life, through reading the gospel, through coming to church, through going to Bible studies, you learn more about who Jesus is and say, I need more of Jesus and less of Bob or myself. What do we know about babies? 
they're cute, but they are messy. The things I've learned about um, babies is they need 24 attention, care, and um, they eat great, but they get rid of what they eat really quick, and that takes some love and support. Darren and I have worked together in youth ministry for quite a while, and one of the things I've said to Darren is teenagers are going to be messy. They're still babies in their faith. Give them a break. Still teach them, but realize that they're still young in their faith. So it is sometimes with us. We're still sometimes baby Christians. And then we move into the spiritual youth age, and 1 Timothy 4.12 tells us, don't let anyone look down on you because you are young, but set an example for believers in speech and conduct and love and faith and impurity. So folks, what I want you to do is, if you've come to know the Lord, let's grow up. Let's not be people of gossip, amen? Let's not be people of anger. Let's not be people of jealousy as they were in the Corinthians church but let's grow up in our faith. I love sometimes what children say. Don't they say the darndest things? And I have some things I want to say that out of the mouth of babes. Patrick, age 10, said, never trust a dog to watch your food. <laughs> Michael said, when your dad is mad at you, don't say... Oh, okay, let me say this again. <laughs> Michael 14 said, when your dad is mad at you and asks you, do I look stupid? Do not answer him. <laughs> Peter, who is 10, said, never tell your mom her diet is not working. Randy, nine years old, said, stay away from prunes. One wonders how he discovered that bit of wisdom. Kevin, age nine, said, never hold a dust buster and a cat at the same time. <laughs> Naomi, 15, said, if you want a kitten, start by asking for a horse. Lauren, age nine, said, red foot Felt tip markers are not good for lipstick. Joel, 10 years old, said, don't pick, up, don't pick on your sister when she's holding a baseball bat. And Eileen, age 8, said, never try to baptize a cat. <laughs> Sometimes we can learn from our children. I remember uh, I was working with an ad council at our church, and there were probably about 15 or 20 um, on this ad council, and I was trying to help them look outside the box. And so I, I had a volleyball, and, and I went to the middle of this large room, and I said, um, please come over here. I've got a challenge for you. And, and I said, here's what I want you to do. The bishop of the Methodist Church has asked us to pass this ball from person to person and see how fast you can do it. And so I didn't say any more than just that. Everyone needs to touch the ball, but pass it from person to person. So they did that, and they got into this circle, and they passed it from person to person to person. And it took about a minute or so for, for them to do that, and I said, well, that's great. But the bishop has now said that if you want to make a difference in the world for your church, you've got to do what you just did in 30 seconds. And, and so they began to talk to each other. How can we do this? How can we, you know, and so they said, let's get into a smaller circle. And so uh, they had to keep the same um, rotation. And so they tried to pass it back and forth. And, and they, they didn't quite make it to, to 30 seconds. Then they did it again. And then they made it to 30 seconds. And then I said, good, you thought outside the box. You've got new, new uh, ways to do this. And I said, now the bishop is coming to you and said, if you really want to make a difference in the world, I want you to think outside of the box, and you've got three seconds. Three seconds to do this. Oh, they were perplexed. How in the world are we going to, how is everyone going to touch the ball in the same order in three seconds? And they thought about this, and they were trying to come up with some kind of way to do it, and they couldn't do it. The chairperson, Derek Kite, had his 10-year-old son, I think he brought him after a baseball practice or something like that, and his 10-year-old son said, I've got it, I've got it, I've got it. Here's what you do. The first person holds the ball, and everyone gets in a circle and just puts their hand out, and the person in the center just zoom, goes around. And they did that in 1.5 seconds. Sometimes, folks, we need to listen to our younger folks. Sometimes we need to think outside of the box. 
there are going to be some things that I'm going to challenge you with or Pastor Ron is going to challenge you with that we can make better disciples, that we can grow our church. And we may scratch our heads and say, how in the world are we going to do that? With God, there's nothing impossible. Amen. With God, there's nothing impossible. I believe you have some great days ahead of you at the Middlebury First United Methodist Church. Jump on board. The water's fine. Amen? Jump on board. The water is fine. Oh, one other thing. When it comes to uh, having um, children know something, how many of you uh, grandparents are here that you're glad that you have grandchildren to teach you how to work your cell phone and your computers? Amen? So, I know that. The third point that I want to bring up is the spiritual adult age. And I want to turn your attention to 2 Peter 3.8. And here's what it tells us. Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It didn't say just know more. It said grow. Grow. How many of you have heard this phrase? Grow till you go. Grow till you go until God calls you heavenward just say well you know i'm 70 years old or whatever age you're in i'm kind of done learning about this christian thing Eh, wrong grow till you go keep learning more and don't be surprised when you cross over to heaven that god gives you this great big 12 volume book on how to even increase your faith even more when you get to heaven grow till you go to him be glory The adult stage of becoming a disciple should be the goal of every Christian. Christians should strive to have a mature understanding of salvation, of sacrifice, of holy living, of serving others in Jesus' name, of being evangelical to share the good news of the gospel to our lost community and to the world, to give a cup of water. That's what it means to be a mature Christian. However, some Christians get stuck in kindergarten class. They get stuck in kindergarten class. They refuse to read their Bible. They refuse to pray. They refuse to go to church. They refuse to tithe to the ministries of the church. They refuse to love their neighbor. But if you ask them, they're a Christian. Yeah, I go to church every now and then. I'm a Christian. No, going to church doesn't make you a Christian any more than sitting in the garage makes you a car. It's more to it. Certainly these folks have had a salvation experience, but they have not made the leap to Christian adult maturity. They are stuck in Christian kindergarten class. They have not grown, nor are they really interested in discipleship process. Amen or ouch! You see, now listen carefully, Christian discipleship takes discipline. Relationship with God takes involvement. Holiness and character takes sacrifice. Righteousness takes dedication to do the right thing. Serving others takes investment. Prayer and Bible study takes commitment of schedule. Aren't those some good words? Discipline, involvement, sacrifice, dedication, investment, commitment. Those are the words that sound like a banker would say some of those words. A teacher would say those words to her students or his students. An insurance salesperson might say that, that if you want to have good insurance, you need discipline, involvement, sacrifice, dedication, investment, and commitment. These are the words that make a mature Christian pull you out of kindergarten into high school and into graduate studies as a Christian. How absurd would it be if you saw this cute little class of five-year-old children around their teacher and their their coloring and and that, and sitting at the end of that was a 35-year-old still in kindergarten. But that's sometimes what we have. It is the mature Christian who makes an impact to change the world. It is the Christian who makes an impact to change their world. You know, we look at the world and we say, how can I change the world? Well, you change your little corner of the world. And if everyone changes their little corner of the world for Jesus Christ, whoo, doggy, that'll change. That'll preach. 
You change your little corner of the world, what you have influence of. It is the strong Christian who leads the church towards growth. It is the mature Christian who looks for opportunities to serve their community and church to make the world a better place. It is the mature Christian who stays away from idle gossip gossip or actions that divide rather than find unity. It is the mature Christian who loves their neighbor, even loves their enemy, and even loves their difficult relative. How many have difficult relatives? Now, difficult relatives are like cousin Eddie and Aunt Edna. Remember that from the vacation? And if you don't think you have a cousin Eddie or an Aunt Edna, maybe you're the cousin Eddie or the Aunt Edna. Who knows? Are you a mature Christian today? Or just a participant? Oh, what you're missing out on if you're just a participant. I pray that we can all be Christian, mature people in our lives. Take the leap. Live a life of Christian discipline, of commitment, of sacrifice, involvement, dedication, and investment towards your spiritual life. God is saying to you, folks, Live in me. Be God with skin on in your little corner of the world. Mature. Grow up. Don't be like the first Corinthian Christian, but grow in your faith. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, help us to be mature in our faith, to leave childish ways behind and serve you as mature adults in our faith. Help us to look for ways to serve you in ministry using our gifts and talents that you have given us to grow in our faith. Help us to become giants in the faith like Moses and Miriam and not immature believers such as Hopney and Phineas who never grew to their spiritual potential. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. I want to ask the communion stewards to come forward at this time to help me serve communion. If you would take your hymn book and turn to page 13, and we'll share in the great Thanksgiving. I want to share something with you today that um, I think is is important for us to understand, that um, Holy Communion is always an altar call. It's always a time for you and God to do spiritual business, okay? Now, most of you in this room were part of the building of this church, whether it was the design of it, whether it was the fundraising part. But one of the things that you decided that was very important was to have an altar in your church. And I'm glad you did. And so when we share Holy Communion, you're going to have the opportunity to come up and kneel down. And if your knees are bad or you don't want to kneel down, just stand here in front and say a prayer. Maybe God has spoke to you this morning. When you're ready after your prayer to receive hold your hand out in a cup-like fashion. We call that the universal sign of need. And our communion stewards will be back behind here. They will come to you, and they will present you with the bread into your hands, and then also the cup, and then you may partake. Stay as long as you would like. And then we will be dismissed row by row, and so when positions open up, you'll be able to come up and kneel or stand and then receive at that time. On page 13, let's read the great thanksgiving together. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right, a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, 
take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, Drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so, in remembrance of these mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world. Until Christ comes in his final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet, through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. On the night that Jesus was with his disciples, he took bread. And he broke it and said, this is my body broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup and he blessed it and said, this is the blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you partake of it, remember, let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, as we partake of this cup, of this bread, may it be for us your body and blood, that we may be for the world your body and blood. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Inside each basket of bread is regular bread, but also gluten-free, if you need gluten-free bread. Pastor Ron is also going to be off to the side to pray for anyone and anoint anyone who needs some special prayer today. One of the things that is so much a blessing for our church is that you have two elders who serve here at the church the Bible says that when you have a special need, you call the elders of the church to pray for you. And so Pastor Ron will be praying for those who need you and he need prayer. So the ushers are going to be at the pews. And they'll dismiss you by row. And you may come up. And again, if you want to kneel, you're welcome to kneel. This is a special time that you may kneel. And when you feel ready, put your hands out like a cup-like fashion, the universal sign of need. The bread will be presented and given to you in the cup. And then you may partake. At this time, let's come to the Lord's table. Verse of trust and obey. It's on page 467, the first verse only. Let's stand together, trust and obey. The words are also on the screen.
Please be seated. We have a special announcement and presentation that we'd like to share with you. Sam, would you come forward, please, up front? <laughs> do, you, do you want to use the microphone there or the podium? You sure can. We've been waiting a long time for this. No. <laughs> if there are any bell choir members that have played under Sam's direction, would you please stand? I want him to see you all. OK. I'm trying to forget him. Hey. Keep them under control. <laughs> On behalf of the Church Bell Choir, we would like to thank Sam Pohl for leading us the last 20 years. Poor Sam. Poor, poor Sam. He came from directing a highly polished military group of musicians that obeyed the tap of his baton with precision and professionalism to a, well, not so much that, collection of volunteers. What the congregation saw on a Sunday morning was far, far different than the previous Wednesday rehearsal when we questioned Sam's sanity that we were prepared for the upcoming Sunday performance. We learned to start a tune from the edge. That's the beginning. We reluctantly learned to count in various time signatures besides 4-4, four, four, but we weren't happy about it. We learned that when he said, one more time for me, he didn't mean it. More like 10 times, at least. It was hard to hit a wrong note that he didn't hear. And mind you, that's picking out one wrong note among 25 or 30 right ones. I do believe his favorite word is again. Play it again. Try it again. Let's hear it again. Not right. Again. Nope. Again. That was really good. Let's do it again. <laughs> and most of you are not aware of the time commitment that is involved with the bells, the setup, the teardown, the 400-pound cases that you need to lift, the maintenance. Yes, bells have breakable parts. <laughs> the cleaning. That's a whole other story. Music selection and ordering and filing. And don't forget dealing with a lovely group of charming people that is 90% women. And did you know that not everybody reads music? So he would mark their notes for them. Sam also shared our talents with the community. We played at many community Lenten services at various churches, the fall festival, a performance at the high school where we ascended out of the orchestra pit. That was fun. I like that one. The Essen House and Public Library for the Cardinal Bus Christmas parties. And when you go on the road, it takes a caravan of vehicles to haul out all that equipment. And Sam was a coordinator. I might also mention that those off-site performances took place at the old church. Remember all those stairs? Up the stairs with load after load. Into the cars, out of the cars, into the building. Set up, tear down, back into the cars, out of the cars at the church. Down the stairs with load after load. I don't know how many times Sam directed us for Sunday morning worship, Christmas Eve services, and weekly practices, but it had to have been several hundred. He grew the bells from three octaves to five. He also added to the chimes and increased the bell music library. We saw substantial growth in the number of participants, too. Much to our dismay, the level of musical difficulty increased, too, a lot. He made the bell choir a true music ministry. We all gave him a hard time every time we got together, and he gave us all we could handle, and then some. But he came back week after week, and so did we. We thank you for your many years of dedicated service to the Handbell Choir, Sam, and may God continue to bless you as you have blessed us. <laughs> Next Sunday is a very special Sunday for us. We are inviting our local police officers, our firefighters, and EMS to our church. And we're going to have a meal for them. So please bring a lot of food. Please invite people to this special service. The way we've designed it is very, very special. We are also remembering and honoring those who gave the ultimate sacrifice in New York, the Pentagon, and in Pennsylvania, 
who serve us. And so please come, bring friends. Um, it'll be a wonderful, wonderful Sunday for us. Let us stand for the benediction. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. And the Lord be with you always until we meet again. And all God's people said, amen. God bless you all. Have a great day.